This is a rainbow hologram. It was created by a process developed by Steve Benton at MIT. Rainbow because it's a multicolor, multiple exposure hologram. Here it doesn't look like much, just a kind of off-color picture of a bunch of animals. But if you looked at it live, of course, uh, then you would know it's a hologram. If you turn your head, look at it from different directions, you would see that it's as though the animals are actually there. You can see them in 3D. What's interesting for us is that the hologram is a method for recording the actual optical field rather than the irradiance of the field. This is done by interfering the signal coming from uh, the animals with the reference beam, and then somehow the, ampli the, the field amplitude rather than the um, irradiance of the field is recorded in the holographic plate. And then the actual field that uh, the animals uh, emit can be re reconstructed by illuminating uh, with the reference beam. Um, and then it's as though the animals were there. We have a window on the world where the animals were because we're looking at the reconstructed signal itself rather than the irradiance, which cannot be done with the photograph. Let's talk about how this works. Computational imaging. Episode 28, holography. So in this chapter, we're interested in imaging with uh, electromagnetic fields. Here's an example of a phased array uh, system that emits a field and then could also be used to detect a reflected field. This would be like with a radar where you can measure the field itself. So you have these large phased array to radar systems that, that can form images by measuring the actual optical field. Now, at optical frequencies, uh, the field is oscillating at hundreds of uh, terahertz, maybe five or 600 terahertz even. Whereas at uh, radar uh, frequencies, it could be kilohertz to gigahertz. At those frequencies, we can build antennas and we can measure the field. The main problem at optical frequencies is that the measurements are photonic, that the um, measurements we make of the optical field involve state transitions where we count actual photons. And the number of photons uh, detected is relatively small, let's say a few thousand compared to a radar system where millions of photons can be involved in the signal that we get from an antenna. What that means is that at optical frequencies, we cannot detect the field itself. We detect the magnitude squared of the field, which is a measure of the irradiance or the power in the field. So we've been through a lot of discussion now with the geometric systems where we built a linear forward model. We have a set of measurements which are multiplied or which, which consists of the unknown object multiplied by a forward matrix H. And we need to invert that to estimate F. Now we find ourselves uh, with a more challenging problem uh, where what we measure is the magnitude squared of F and we'd like to find F itself. The assistance we have in doing that is that we can transform the field before we measure it by various mechanisms. And so we try to solve this quadratic form problem of solving a quadratic equation in F uh, for the unknown field uh, by some coding mechanism. Two basic coding strategies are popular. Um, one is uh, holography, which we'll talk about in today's episode, uh, which was uh, first proposed by uh, Dennis Gabor, who we see here on the left. Uh, the other is uh, phase retrieval, where we computationally find the phase under uh, constrained and multiple sam constrained sampling and multiple sampling. Uh, this was developed uh, by uh, various investigators uh, dating back to the 1950s, but a particularly popular algorithm uh, that we'll discuss in our next episode was developed uh, by James Finup, who's shown here. Now, a fun thing to think about is why do we need the phase? Is how important is phase in images? And so this is just a fun little exercise where we can take uh, the Fourier transform of these two images, which is basically my, what might happen to the field as it propagates, uh, and take the modulus of the Fourier transform. And as you see here, uh, for many uh, images in the natural world, uh, the image is relatively constant, the field is relatively constant, so the Fourier transform is concentrated around low frequencies. And on the right, we show the phase of these images. So we've just taken the Fourier transform of the two images and show their magnitude and their phase. And now if we take the inverse Fourier transform, of course, we would recover the images. But an interesting thing to look at would be, well, what if we swap the phase? So we multiply the magnitude of the Fourier transform of the Gabor picture with the phase of the uh, Fina picture and vice versa. And what you see is that now we take the inverse Fourier transform, uh, we recover the opposite image. So in typical uh, imaging systems, the phase is a, a strong carrier of information because it's not dominated by low frequencies uh, like the magnitude uh, tends to be. So figuring out a way to recover the phase from the modulus of the field is critical to getting uh, the information that we need to form images. 
So today we're talking about holography, and here you see uh, uh, Dr. Gabor explaining uh, holography, and including a, a photographic plate there on which the object is observed uh, in combination with the reference. So the strategy here for solving the quadratic form problem is to linearize it by adding this reference beam. So we have the unknown field distribution F, and we add a reference beam R. We take the magnitude squared of that, and now we have a bunch of terms here. One is F squared, R squared, both of which would be might be difficult for us to uh, find the uh, field from. But we have this term, uh, F times R conjugate. And if we could isolate that term, because we know R, uh, we could uh, find out what the unknown field is. So holography basically consists of finding ways to get rid of those other terms and uh, find the unknown field by its interference with the re reference beam. So the disadvantages are that the, the signal and the reference have to be uh, coherent. So the, the, we need to have this possibility of interference between the signals. We'll talk about the meaning of coherence uh, in a few episodes when we get into chapter seven of the text. Uh, so it may not always be possible to have a reference beam, in which case uh, we need to find alternative methods of recovering the, the uh, field. Um, and there, there may be multiple sources, in which case the coherence uh, would be suspect. Um, phase retrieval, in contrast, which is the topic of our, our next episode, uh, considers measurement of a transformation of the field without a reference beam, uh, and then we, we find a way to code the forward model in ways to allow us to recover the phase. But we'll, we'll talk about that in another uh, uh, in the next episode. It turns out to be much more computationally intensive um, and needs appropriate coding. Uh, but is increasingly doable. And I would say, as we'll see in the sequence of the next several episodes, uh, the concepts of holography and uh, phase retrieval are really converging in the modern computational imaging age. Before we get to those broader concepts, let's talk about just basic uh, strategies for holographic recording. So we're interested here in digital holography, where we're going to record uh, the field on a electronic uh, focal plane, in this case shown here is a charge coupled device, and then all the holographic formation will be uh, computational, so we're not going to display uh, the holograms we did in, on the introduction today. We have the object field coming here, we're going to combine it with a reference wave, uh, and as uh, noted before, uh, we've modeled that as shown here, that we have a reference wave. Now here we show the reference sub M with the concept that we could have more than one reference wave uh, to try to recover the field. And if, for example, uh, we could shift the phase of the reference in sequence. If we do that, um, then um, uh, the uh, as we shift the phase of the reference beam, the, the, the phase of the magnitude squared of F won't change, magnitude squared of R won't change, but the phase of these two terms will change. And so we can do Fourier analysis on, on that uh, changing phase of the reference wave and recover uh, the, un the uh, unknown field F. And that can be done with, with very high accuracy, uh, as shown in the, the notes. Uh, the Kramer L lower bound for estimation of a single mode uh, reconstructed in this way uh, is one. And what that means is that the um, variance of the estimated signal, shown here is the variance of the real and imaginary parts, should be the uh, imaginary part here. Um, is one, meaning that there's a one photon error. So with the more photons we have in the mode, um, the better the signal to noise ratio will be growing approximately as the square root of the number of photons in the mode. If we have, you know, n modes, then the, the, the mean square error would be n, basically one photon per mode uh, error. So that's how holography works. Uh, if we take multiple uh, um, measurements, uh, we can get to this bound. If we make a single measurement, it's more challenging, but uh, people often want to do um, more efficient systems and make single measurements. And so a popular method for doing that is uh, Lithiopachnik's uh, holography, uh, where uh, rather than shifting the reference to multiple phases, uh, we have a reference beam uh, where the phase changes spatially. And so now we, we've uh, assuming basically uh, that the object field is at low enough spatial frequencies that modulation of the spatial field of the reference is sufficient to have taken enough measurements uh, to isolate uh, the signal term F. So that can be done uh, by in analog form by illuminating with the reference as we talked about in the introduction. In digital form that can be done by spatial filtering. So in the uh, uh, Jupyter notebook that accompanies uh, this lecture, uh, there's an analysis and simulation of various holographic systems. Uh, the notebook uh, includes, uh, of course, the uh, propagation uh, code that we talked about in episode 27, where we want to propagate 
uh, the field F, a distance D for a given uh, wavelength to sampling ratio. Once we propagate the field, um, we can uh, create a hologram. So here we uh, uh, take the uh, propagated field from the signal and we add the reference beam uh, to it with the spatial variation in the reference beam, take its magnitude squared. That's our uh, recorded hologram. Now, in this case, if we just take the Fourier transform of the uh, hologram, uh, here we've subtracted off the reference just to get, get rid of that uh, term, then uh, what we would expect to find uh, is the um, reconstructed object field uh, at some uh, position um, uh, shifted because of the, of the uh, um, because of its carrier frequency, and then we can take the reconstructed object field and propagate it minus D to recover an image of the original object. So in the uh, Jupyter Notebook uh, that's done here, we have uh, uh, you know, the recorded hologram, uh, the Fourier transform of the hologram minus the reference with the, uh, the signal terms so here and the conjugate signal term here. We propagate back and we recover uh, the object. Here the object is modulated by a carrier frequency because of the carrier frequency uh, writing on the reference beam. So basically the object is propagating an angle. So we, when we see it in a, in a plane, we see that kind of phase modulation from the angle of propagation. The original object is the number two here and the re reconstructed object has that amplitude modulation because it's propagating at some, some angle. So um, Gabor uh, developed holography around 1948-1949 uh, using, uh, originally proposing it for electron microscopy, uh, but using uh, what's called inline holography that we'll talk about in just a second. Um, Leith and Upaknix uh, proposed this uh, off-axis holography with a carrier frequency uh, in uh, 1963. In between those two times, you know, the laser was invented, which made holography a lot more practical, and this ability of having beams propagated at an angle came into play. Lethe and Yupaknix came at this problem from the point of view of communication theory. So basically, they're doing what's called frequency uh, domain uh, multiplexing, where they've put the hologram on a carrier frequency where it can be filtered out. Since that time, of course, uh, communication theory has become much more advanced. Uh, we have ideas like uh, um, orthogonal codes like we used in uh, uh, coded aperture imaging where we could put signals on these kinds of codes and pull them back out. And these can be more efficient at using the overall uh, signal bandwidth uh, than this uh, uh, off-axis or, or uh, frequency domain modulation. As a simple example in the notes, uh, we consider using a random reference beam. So now um, the reference beam uh, is just a, a random phase field that's added to the, uh, the diffracted signal. And now if we multiply by the conjugate of the reference uh, and then uh, backpropagate, uh, you see we get a very well reconstructed object without the kind of artifacts that we had with the Leith and Eupactic holography. Now it's at the center of the field rather than off at some angle. The challenge, of course, is how would you calibrate a random reference beam at, at all uh, propagation distances uh, for this kind of reconstruction? So this is where uh, mathematically something is very practical, but but uh, physically may be more challenging to implement. But we live in the age where uh, you know mathematically difficult and physically difficult things are possible. So it's definitely something to think about is what if, what if we used a random reference beam? On the other hand, we could look at Gabor holography and say, could we use uh, you know, modern estimators to overcome the difficulties of Gabor holography and remove a confusion between an unknown object and, and the background terms that you'd get from online holography. So a Gabor hologram uh, has the reference and the signal beam co-propagating. And so when we, when we look at the Gabor hologram, uh, you now see that it, it would be more difficult to find the carrier frequency and separate the signals. If we just take the Gabor hologram and backpropagate it, then we get the reconstruction at, at the right. So it has artifacts from the background uh, uh, inside of it, um, but uh, uh, you can see the object there. But we could also say, well, could we then take a, a neural processor and, and remove that background? These are examples of uh, Gabor holograms uh, with phase-only objects and with diffuse objects. Um, that uh, you know, you see, we can re reconstruct phase objects uh, with holographic estimations. But then we can take the, these systems and try to estimate the underlying object with a neural processor or moving artifacts. And is uh, developed in the in the GitHub library uh, that comes with this uh, lecture. Uh, that tends to work uh, pretty well. So th this uh, has been a recent trend: is to do these. Uh, um, uh, Gabor holograms with uh, neural processing to recover the signal uh, rather than worrying about uh, some complicated uh, coding strategy. Uh, so next in these lectures, I thought it would be good to just show uh, what, what kind of things you can see with a hologram. So th this is an example 
of a, uh, a high pixel count, gigapixel scale hologram. Uh, the um, spatial resolution uh, that you can see, uh, the remote object uh, image through a hologram, uh, depends on the aperture size of the hologram. And we'll, we'll talk about the relationship between aperture size and resolution in successive lectures when we begin to talk about uh, focal imaging systems. Basically, the, the hologram has some aperture A, and uh, if we want to uh, resolve angularly, we'll find that the angular resolution is going to be something like lambda over A. And so the, the feature size, we could see a distance uh, Z away would be uh, lambda uh, uh, Z over A. Um, but if we increase A, then we expect that resolution to go up. And we can see that simply uh, with a holographic system. So in this case, uh, we have a uh, aperture here consisting of a single CCD camera. Uh, and we're going to observe objects, but we're going to move the aperture around to try to create a synthetic aperture uh, from the hologram. So in, in this case, uh, uh, the uh, camera has uh, you know, just over uh, a megapixel of uh, resolution. Um, but we can scan it to 21 different positions and capture 635 megapixel effective resolution. Uh, this was used here to look at this uh, remote object uh, shown here as a printed circuit board as shown here. Uh, here's a, um, a DSLR image uh, zooming in on the, the uh, uh, printed circuit board. Now if we reconstruct the, ho the hologram with a single uh, hologram, so we've uh, measured uh, with a reference beam of the field and back propagated it the meter or so that goes back to this object and you see that this this is the reconstruction now if we instead use uh, 49 apertures so we've shifted the position to 49 different samples you see the resolution is increased and all we've done here is add the fields estimated from these 49 apertures together and those fields add up uh, coherently to create a higher resolution image and then here's an example of uh, the image going up uh, even further as we go to uh, 400 and some scanned positions of the uh, holographic sensor and uh, increasing the, the resolution. Once we have the field, because we have the actual field here rather than an image of the object, uh, we can also uh, refocus. So here's an example of improving the resolution a little bit by taking the um, propagated field and finding its optimal focal position. So digital holography is a, a strong and powerful technique for measuring the field. So in episode 27, we talked about once you know the field on some boundary, uh, we can use um, uh, angular spectrum or other computational methods to propagate the field. But the challenge is how would we know the field? Because we can only measure the irradiance at optical frequencies. Uh, holography by adding a reference is a solution to that problem. But as we saw in today's uh, discussion, uh, that process uh, you know, of holography assuming, for example, linear filtering to recover the hologram, has been revolutionized by modern estimators, which can take uh, coded diffraction in a variety of forms and recover the field. So one question would be, could we even do, with Gabor holography, we have a certain model for the reference beam as propagating through the object. Of course, now the question is, could we do holography without a reference beam at all? And that's the topic of, of phase retrieval. And we'll uh, discuss phase retrieval continuously throughout the, the next um, sequence of, of um, episodes uh, coming up to the ideas of could we build uh, even cameras that capture the field without a wavefront or without a reference beam, which we'll get to eventually. But for the next time, we'll talk about basic algorithms for phase retrieval.